Chapter five is such a long chapter that we actually split it into unit one and the second half in unit two. And so it really is foundational to the whole rest of the course. Um, it's called the sedimentary archive, and it's really about how we dissect sedimentary rocks to really learn about the Earth's history, which is obviously a gigantic component of historical geology. So we start here with this picture I took years ago of um, Antelope Canyon, which is in Arizona, just outside of Page, Arizona. And this is my favorite rock layer, just so you know. <laughs> this is called the Navajo Sandstone. It's named such because it is number one, a sandstone, but number two, it's in the Navajo Nation. And I love this sandstone. It has these beautiful cross beds um, that were deposited when the environment in the Jurassic period was in the southwestern US was a giant desert. Um, and all of these sand dunes deposited these very very steeply sloping cross beds that were then later lithified into the Navajo sandstone. This is a slot canyon, which we learned about in physical geology, where you have erosion when um, you have erosion and then weathering along joints in areas that are very far from base level. Um, and it is like as, <laughs> as unspiritual as I am, this is one of the most spiritual places I've ever been. It's just, it's amazing. I hope you get to go sometime. So your first activity this chapter had to do with terms regarding tectonic setting and understanding our tectonic setting. And in Rochester, we're in the platform, right? Um, because we live on sedimentary rock layers that overlie eroded mountains. So um, the eroded mountains are the shield and the platform is on top of the shield. And so that's our tectonic setting. We live in an area that is reasonably far from mountains, but not unbelievably far because our distance from orogenic belts, which are mountain, which are where you have mountain building occurring, um, really controls the size of the class. And this is something that we talked about um, and we'll actually do a little activity on in just a short while. Um, about how as material is transported further away from a source area or a mountain range that sediments will grade from coarse grained to fine grained as distance is increasing. So close to the mountain range, you tend to have larger particles or clasts and that those particles as the distance is increasing, those particles break down over time. They break down because of water, wind and ice and in general, as distance increases, class size will decrease. But not every place is close to mountains. In some places, you have very level topography. You have very, like, think, um, think southeastern United States, right, where there's really not a whole lot of mountains. Um, even probably about as close as you get from the mountains to the beach are in, uh, in North Carolina, where you have the Blue Ridge Mountains that are probably four hours away from the Atlantic Ocean. In areas, but Florida especially illustrates this beautifully. Um, so when you have very flat topography or level topography, you don't have big class because there really is no source area nearby. So you have a lot of fine grain sediments, but then eventually once all of your cla clastic material like gravel, sand, silt, and clay, once that all settles out, and there's no more sediment left in the water, what begins to precipitate are calcareous materials like limestone, which is illustrated here as LS, or dolostone, although dolostone doesn't really form in the modern, um, but you start to have more limestone deposits. We'll talk about dolostone later. It's very contentious. So here we have really flat topography. And this is a very, very typical situation as you move offshore in an area that's very far from mountain ranges. So where we have the beach and we have sort of the interface between ocean, between the marine and the terrestrial environment, we a lot of times have deltas, but in general we have sand deposit. So water requires energy to carry particles and there's more energy close to the coastline. And as you start to get offshore, you have finer grain materials that'll settle like silts, which is kind of in here, and then clays which are always, so just um, sandstone is typically illustrated by this sort of stippled pattern. And once this sand, of course, is lithified, it turns into sandstone. We'll talk about the word facies next unit, I believe. 
Um, but then you have your next particle size down, clay will settle. And when clay lithifies, which is again, turning into rock, right? When clay settles and lithifies, it is turned into shale, but there's really nothing finer grained than clay. So once you get pretty far offshore to the point where there is no sediment any longer being shed from the continents, what begins to form is calcite and calcite is the primary mineral that's found in limestone. So you don't usually find limestone really close to the continent. Um, you have to get a little bit of ways offshore. The energy level of the water typically has to quiet down and limestone is usually found in very warm environments too. So if you are in an area where you're close to a mountainous region, you're not going to have a lot of limestone form. But as you get further away from your source area and you find yourself in more level topography, you will have more calcareous material or limestone precipitate from the seawater. So other things that are controlled by what's going on in our tectonic setting is how thick our deposits of sediment end up being. So sometimes there can be so much sediment deposited that the basin that the sediment is deposited in actually sinks under its own weight. Um, and so when you have a subsiding basin, you have a relatively high sedimentation rate, lots of sediment being shed from mountains, and the basin which is collecting all that sediment begins to subside under its own weight. That's an idea called isostatic subsidence. So you can think of that um, I guess sort of in the form of like an iceberg. As icebergs get bigger and thicker, they just kind of float lower in the water, right? And so what'll happen is that as deposits of sediment get thicker, the actual lithosphere will begin to subside just a, just a bit. And it'll happen as long as you have continual um, deposition of sediment into those basins. So here's an, and what you end up with is tremendously thick deposits of sediment, like sometimes thousands of meters thick. This is, these are really important places for oil and gas exploration. So here is a picture, and I'm going to give you a second to um, sort of acclimate yourself. This is parts of North America in the middle Devonian period. So about 385 million years ago. And this is New York state right here, right? And there's Pennsylvania, Virginia, um, and so on and so forth. There's Ohio. Um, so during that time period, you can see that the East Coast of North America looked very different. You can see that from the, what we now call the Appalachians, um, there was an extension or sort of an ancient version of the Appalachians that was growing called the Acadian Mountains. And the Acadian Mountains, which we'll learn more about when we study the Paleozoic era, um, were being uplifted here. And there was a series of deltas that came down for, and entered into what's called the Appalachian Basin, just a narrow body of water that was underwater at this point. So there's tons of sediment being shed from the Catskills, from, from the Acadian Mountains and deposited in the Appalachian Basin. So what we see when we do a cross section or a vertical slice in the earth from the Catskill Mountains across to Chautauqua Lake is we see an incredible but very predictable um, sequence of sediments. So ice, this is a diagram to just kind of understand isostatic rebound. So here we have our Acadian Mountains and they're heavy. So that's called a topographic load. Um, and you have subduction. So this is an ancient subduction zone. So you would have had an ocean trench right here too. And this region here, the basin fill load, this is the Appalachian Basin. So sediment is going to be shed from the Catskill Delta down into the Appalachian Basin. And we just said that when you're close to a mountainous area, right, you have larger particles here, and then they grade to final, fi finer particles as you move away. Um, and that is what is represented in the rock record. So we study, we take our application of our understanding of sedimentation in the present, and we apply it to the past. So here is that cross section from the Catskill Mountains to Chautauqua Lake in the southern tier of New York State. So this is the symbol of a conglomerate layer. Conglomerate is poorly sorted but large grain size. The yellow color you see you here that you see here, that's sand size particles. Then this pinkish purpley color here, that's silt. And then the green is shale. So you can see not only that you have this basin that is 
bowl shaped because it is subsiding under its own weight, but that it's also grading from coarse grain close to the source area to finer grained as you move away. So when we expand this over the entire Appalachian Basin, we see what is illustrated here in this isopack map. So an isopack map is a map that instead of contour lines, these connect points of equal thickness. So this tells you how much sediment was deposited from the Catskill Mount, from the Acadian Mountains here in meters. And so you can see that here's the 2000 meter uh, here's 2,000 meters of sediment deposit that was shed from the Acadian Mountains. Here's 3,000, right? 4,000. And you can see that close to the Acadian source area, you have over 9,000 meters over a kilometer, right? Um, over, almost 10 kilometers, really, of sediment that is deposited from the erosion of these mountains. And the basin just kind of subsides under its own weight. And when you think about some of the rock layers that are found in this area, we do have not great oil deposits, but really good natural gas deposits. Um, and the coal deposits will hold off on because that is a slightly different story to be told later. But where you have subsiding basins because you're near an orogenic belt, you tend to have very thick deposits of sediment. Now again, to use Florida as the other extreme of that example, where you have stable basins, shallow basins, um, that are not, by stable I mean not being um, increasing or decreasing really in elevation, um, you just have sediment that gets sorted by wave action in a very predictable way. So the part of the continent that is drowned by the ocean from the rising sea level is called the continental shelf. And on the continental shelf, we see a very predictable um, sequence here of sand being deposited, then silt, then clay, and then limestone and coral in warm water, very similar to what we saw on a previous slide. And so again, you see that very predictable transition from sandstone, this should actually be siltstone, to shale, to limestone. And to show you using Google Earth, exactly how large this carbonate plateau, which is what it's often called, you can, uh, you can see that here. So all of this region, this flat area adjacent to Florida and then to parts of Alabama and Louisiana, this is the continental shelf, this very flat area where you have lots of wave action, lots of sediment sorting, and then here is what's called the slope break and you start to go down to the continental slope and then down to more of the abyssal plain really. Um, but regardless, this is where all of the, um, we have very little sediment coming in. So we have sandstone along the shoreline transitioning to shale and then lots of carbonate and material being formed, which will in the future be, um, be limestone. So all of this is really to get to one of the big goals of chapter five, which is to determine the depositional environment of a rock. And um, that's one of the great fun challenges of this class is to look at all of the characteristics of sedimentary rocks and be able to figure out what environment that rock formed in. Um, and so uh, that's what a depositional environment is, all the factors under which sediment is deposited. And um, initially this is a challenge and but you'll get better at it and you'll be amazing at it by the end of the semester because there are environments that will be found in continental um in continental environments like rivers and lakes and and things like that um then they're going to be transitional environments environments that we find where land and sea meet not only beaches and deltas but also there'll be lagoons there will be um tidal flats that we'll talk about and you'll see and then finally, when you transition to an environment that is really just characterized by salt water, you get into marine environments. And then underneath each of these three umbrellas, there's probably somewhere between five and 10 different examples of continental, transitional, or marine environments. Um, and it's a good time. So what sort of things do, do we gather? Well, we look at all the sediment characteristics in a rock. Um, are grains rounded? Are they well sorted? What color is the rock what minerals do we find that are composed that are within the rock uh, what fossils do we find fossils can be very informative to tell us um, which environment a rock might form it have formed in 
color of the rock, which you will find shortly, can also give you a really good understanding of what the oxygen availability was in those con in those. Um, areas and then finally sedimentary structures so you have a whole lab on sedimentary structures but we will also um, cover a lot of the material you'll need for that lab uh, later this chapter all right great times um, so now it's time for you to learn a little bit more about sediment characteristics